Whilst it can be said that there are many cases of the paranormal that have the ability to leave one unsettled, very rarely does one encounter a truly chilling, truly horror movie-esque happening that, despite its difficult to digest details, is claimed to have been 100% real. In the February of 1840, a young destitute family moved into a modest ground floor apartment in the small German town of Motlingham. Two brothers and three sisters, the Dittesses were orphans, the parents of the family having died some time earlier, leaving their eldest child, a young man by the name of Andreas, to care for his siblings. His brother was half blind, and his youngest sister, a devout 24 year old, suffered ongoing ill health. Her name was Gottlieben, and despite her faithfulness, she was destined, so it seemed, to find herself at the centre of what can only be described as the most horrific, most gruesome, and quite possibly most well documented case of demonic possession and exorcism in all history. The story which follows is neither trick nor treat. There are no Halloween pranks or embellishments in its telling. Rather, by the Lutheran pastor who chronicled its details, it is alleged to be wholly authentic. Before then, however, I ask for a brief moment to offer you a different sort of trick or treat befitting the season. Raid Shadow Legends is a truly triple A quality free to play game with over 600 champions endowed with unique abilities. Immerse yourself in Halloween monsterific boss battles, dungeon raids, campaigns and PvP arena battles by mastering innumerable tactics and exploring millions of champion combinations. Simply by using my QR code or links below to download Raid yourself, with it being available both on mobile and PC. Many horrors await you in Raid, not least of all the Hydra clan boss, a behemothic beast boasting multiple heads, each with a different ability, requiring a different strategy to destroy. Then, of course, there is the Shadowkin, a whole new faction which Raid added to the game last year. Liberated from the reign of evil, these delightfully dark warriors are not necessarily the good guys, which makes them some of my favourite champions to play with. At the moment, Raid is running an unmissable trick-or-treat promotion Halloween, where new players can win not merely in-game prizes, but a plethora of real-life ones as well, including $1,000 Amazon gift cards and some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions. Truly a treat worthy of the time of year. Best of all, it's free to get involved. All you need is your Raid player ID. Simply download Raid with my link in the description, then head to trickortreat.polarium.com, enter your details, spin the wheel, and get your prize. This special event runs until the 5th of November, and once it's over, it's over. So be fast and spin, spin, spin. And so, there's never been a better time to get started if you are still yet to play Raid. New players, use my link or scan the QR code on screen to get a free starter pack worth almost $30, including a free champion, Tayral, and all this fantastic in-game loot. You will find these rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Thank you for listening and supporting Raid, who, through their sponsorship, helps make my content possible. Now, on with the video. The Dittuses were a poor family, and so the home into which they moved in early 1840 can be described as little other than ramshackled. Located on the outskirts of the town, the building which housed their apartment was weather-worn and depressing. The interior was similarly bleak, with all members of the family commenting, as soon as they moved in, how they heard recurring creaks, bangs and shuffles, almost as though the building was straining to get away from itself. But these were no ordinary noises. They seemed to come from every nook and corner, and would sometimes last all night, scuffling and trampling across the bedroom as the siblings tried to sleep. The people who lived above them likewise reported hearing strange sounds, although they cared little to discuss them with outsiders. In this way, from the very first day, Gottlieb and Dittus was wary of her new home, so much so in fact that she would later claim that she straight away felt as though there was a peculiar influence on her when there. 
for certainly on the first day of their arrival, when she prayed at the table, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, she had fits in which she fell onto the floor unconscious. After that, a change, it is said, came over her. A once respected young woman of unsullied reputation, noted for her faithfulness, good Christian education, and remarkable ability to compose fine songs, Gottlieben was now avoided by others in the town. Widely disliked, she is said to have had something repulsive and inexplicable in her behaviour, and a repugnant way about her. At the time, however, little was said about it, her altered personality being ascribed to the tragedy of her being an orphan. And so life continued for the Dittuses. They, like their neighbours above them, adopted a policy of silence in regards to the sinister things that were heard and eventually, according to Gottlieben, seen in their home. Life was, after all, difficult enough already. Then, in the autumn of 1841, Gottlieben approached Johann Christoph Blumhardt, a Lutheran theologian who had moved to the area in 1838 and now served as the town's pastor. Zealous and devoted, he was 36 years old at the time and was eager to listen to the young woman's spiritual grievances. After all, although Gottlieben had long attended his sermons, walking a great distance each week to do so, she had, until this point, not once disclosed to him the peculiar happenings she and her family endured at their apartment. And so, it was seemingly in a state of desperation that she visited Blumhardt at his parsonage and told him of the nightly temptations which she suffered. They had, she explained to him, reached an ever higher degree, and as such brought her much torment. Other than this, however, she would not disclose any more. Wanting to help, but limited in his ability to do so, Bloomheart failed to coax further information out of her, and so watched her leave, highly reticent about her strange experiences, and yet clearly distressed by them. It was in December, only a few weeks later, that Bloomheart and Gottlieben's paths crossed again. The young woman had fallen ill, dangerously so. She was attended to by medical doctors, and also Bloomheart, who visited her so as to pray over her. And yet, as strong as his spiritual calling was, the pastor disliked tending to her. Whenever he entered the room in which she lay, the young woman would look at him out of the corner of her eye silent and without greeting him. She would not pay any attention to his words, and would even seem nearly unconscious in his presence, something which Blumhardt considered her to be feigning, for she had not been in such a condition before or after his visits. She was, he concluded, self-willed, self-righteous, and a spiritually proud person. Repulsed by her behaviour and wanting to avoid any further embarrassments, Bloomheart thus, like many others in the town, kept his distance. There was then, it seems, something inexplicable and eerie about Gottlieben that unsettled everyone around her. That we know all that we do about Gottlieben is thanks to Bloomheart, specifically the report which he wrote some three years later about the young woman, her family, and the phenomena which, all too quickly, overwhelmed all those involved. By April 1842, the young woman was fully recovered, and it was at this point that Bloomheart, after a period of avoidance, became more involved in her case. Writing in his report, he explained that two of Gottlieben's relatives came to him seeking advice. Events at the apartment had become so out of control that they could no longer be concealed. The bizarre trampling sounds were now so loud that the entire neighbourhood could hear them. Not only that, Gottlieben was acting especially strange. She claimed, horrifically, that she saw with special frequency the figure of a woman from the area who had died two years previous. This woman, so Gottlieben reported, would always stand in the same place in front of her bed, holding a dead child in her arms. Thus, this was how the pastor first learnt something about the ghost in the Ditter's house. According to Gottlieben's testimony, the spectral woman would at times move towards her, still holding the deceased infant, whereafter she would repeat the words, I want to be left alone, or give me paper and I won't come back. 
There would also be shimmers of light in the room, a phenomenon which was witnessed by others who stayed in the apartment. Gottlieben was instructed not to engage with the phantom. Whatever the manifestation's purpose was, the pastor concluded it could only be bad. And certainly not long afterwards, half a piece of paper was discovered under a bed at the threshold of the bedroom door. It was covered in soot and all written upon. Due to the soot, it was illegible, but next to it there had been placed several coins, each wrapped in paper dusted with soot. From what could be ascertained, the writing seemed to be a prescription, possibly of magic. Where it or the coins had come from, no one knew. A couple of weeks later, a light flickering on the floor behind the stove revealed a whole number of things which had been buried there. Salt, chalk, bones, and yet more coins wrapped in sooty paper. After examination, it was feared that these items may have been remnants of some black magic, and so, accepting the coins, the pastor burnt them all. The strangeness, however, did not conclude with the fire. In fact, if anything, it escalated. In his report, Bloomhart goes into detail about how the peculiar noises in the apartment, most especially the sound of trampling footsteps, were so loud and so frequent that passers-by were scared. One could hear it during the day as well as the night, often when no one was in the living room. On those occasions when Gottlieben was in the room, it was worse still. The table would be shook violently as the trampling noises sounded all around her. By this point, everyone in Mottlingen seems to have had at least some small measure of awareness of the case. Not merely that, as Bloomhart points out, visitors from elsewhere were starting to arrive in the town so as to witness the happenings for themselves. As for the pastor, he appears to have been somewhat sceptical. Appealing to the mayor and several other men from the town council, he arranged for an investigation of the Ditter's home to be conducted. And so, arriving in the evening unexpectedly, they proceeded to comb through the apartment. As soon as Bloomheart entered the living room, two immense bangs allegedly sounded from the bedroom. In a short time, others followed. Noises, bangs, and knockings of the most varied kind were heard mostly in the bedroom, where Gottlieben lay on her bed, fully dressed. When the pastor said a short prayer, with the rest singing a hymn around him, the activity increased. Supposedly, windows rattled, chairs leapt from the floor, and sand fell from the ceiling. In the space of three hours, twenty-five bangs were heard towards a certain spot in the bedroom. When the floorboards there were removed so as to determine the source of the banging, yet more magical oddities were supposedly discovered. Scraps of paper, mysterious powders, small packages of money, and chillingly, a pot which contained small bones mixed with earth. The very next day, after attending church in the morning, Gottlieben was found at home in a deep faint and near death. According to Bloomheart, who rushed to aid her, the young woman was lying on her bed, quite stiff. The skin of her head and arms was glowing and trembling, but the rest of her body indicated suffocation. Despite medical doctors attempting to revive her, nothing could be done to help her. Half an hour later, she awakened. Trembling, she whispered to the pastor that she had seen her again. The dead woman with the dead child. Returning home after church, the spectre, so Gottlieben claimed, had been waiting for her, infant in arms in the living room. Upon seeing her, the young woman had fainted. And so, after this, for Bloomheart, there was no saying otherwise. There truly was something strange and terrible going on in the home of the Ditter's family. Anxious that things were getting out of hand, for indeed there were already rumours of secret dark magic, hidden bones, and an infanticidal spectre stalking the town, Bloomheart found alternative accommodation for Gottlieben. The apartment, he believed, was the cause of the activity, thus removing her from it would resolve the situation. And so she was told not to return to it. The building, meanwhile, was watched by the town's policemen, with there being great effort spent to suppress the growing interest in the building, and discourage visitors from attempting to spend the night there so as to experience the otherworldly happenings for themselves. 
Slowly, things quieted down, and for the people of Motlingen, the affair, as peculiar and dramatic as it had been, was concluded. And yet, for Gottlebin and Blumhardt, this was not the case. For, as the pastor writes in his report, what followed next was kept secret from the rest of the town, both for Gottlebin's protection and theirs. By the summer of 1842, the tramplings and other strange sounds were being experienced in the new house. Somehow, they had followed Gottlieben. Not just that, the activity had grown more extreme, with the unfortunate young woman supposedly suffering frequent violent convulsions. These became ever stronger and longer lasting, so that many times she would hardly be free for five minutes in between. Now intimately involved in the case, often visiting Gottlieben so as to act as her spiritual advisor, Blumhardt was able to record many details about her experiences. She would faint in front of him, tremble and convulse, so much so that every muscle in her head and her arms was in glowing motion, although she was rigid and stiff otherwise. Often foam would flow out of her mouth. She would twist her arms, turn her head, lift her body up high, all while unconscious. Sometimes this would last for hours, with the doctor who was tending to her helpless to do anything. It was, in short, horrifying. Such activity continued for several days, until Bloomheart could only conclude that something demonic played a role in the young woman's suffering. After all, on one occasion, when she regained consciousness, Gottlieben confided in the pastor that she had seen something floating in front of her eyes which made her rigid. And so, it was that during one of her violent episodes, the pastor, unable to tolerate seeing the young woman suffer any longer, jumped up and, in his own words, took her stiff hands, pulled her fingers together with force as for prayer, loudly spoke her name into her ear in her unconscious state, and said, Fold your hands and pray, Lord Jesus help me. We have seen long enough what the devil is doing, now we also want to see what Jesus can do. According to Bloomheart's report, after a moment she awakened, prayed those words, and the convulsion stopped. Everyone in the room, Bloomheart included, was silently shocked. Thus, they seemed to have a weapon with which to fight the oppression, prayer, and the power of Jesus. Until that moment, Bloomheart, a Lutheran pastor, unused to the uncompromising and combatant rite of exorcism deployed by his Catholic counterparts, had not thought to take a stand against the violent happenings in such a way. And so, Bloomheart entered into the habit of rushing to the young woman's bedside whenever she suffered an attack, each time mirroring his earlier call to prayer, and each time it seemed, more or less, to work. Whatever force was possessing Gottlieben shrank whenever the pastor appealed to Jesus. After several sessions, Bloomheart was beginning to have hope that the young woman would recover. Then one day, everything worsened. According to the pastor's written report, the possessing force, despite being banished by prayer, returned with a stronger energy, almost as though its rage had been renewed and emboldened by attempts to exercise it. Summoned to the house once more, Bloomheart reportedly discovered Gottlieben in a terrible state. Lying on her bed, her entire body was in motion, and she made horrible faces, her only intention being wrath and rage as she tried to reach for the pastor in an attempt to hurt him. There was, he wrote, something hostile in her, something which seemed determined to prevent him from intervening. As before, he started to pray and say the name of Jesus. At that, the young woman immediately rolled back her eyes and began to speak, only the voice with which she spoke could instantly be recognised as not being hers, not only because of the tone, but because of the expression and character of it. I cannot stand to hear that name, the voice is alleged to have said. All in the room were terrified. Even so, Bloomheart proceeded to engage the voice in conversation. And so it was that he, so he detailed in his report, discovered the identity of the entity that was possessing Gottlieben, or rather, entities, as horrifically, fourteen demons are said to have inhabited her body. Not only that, they were led, so it seemed, by the spirit of the murderess whom Gottlieben had claimed to have seen haunting her home. 
She, so Bloomheart explained, identified herself as a killer of two children. She had buried them in the field, and for that was condemned to a restless afterlife. I cannot pray. That is the reward for my deeds. A practitioner of dark magic, the voice claimed that she was forever bound to do the devil's bidding. Thus, in his bondage, she was determined to make Gottlebin suffer. As incredible as these claims may be, Bloomheart took great care to present them in a clear and precise manner in the report he later produced for his superiors, all of which heightens the incredible and breathtakingly diabolical nature of this case. After all, Gottlieben's face, he wrote, changed each time a new voice took over, with a new threatening expression being assumed. Many threatening words are said to have been spoken to the pastor, with the entities possessing the young woman clear that they would have loved to have harmed him, even if, for some reason, they were not allowed to. And so, instead, they took their rage out on others present in the room, including the mayor, who is said to have received many a knock and fist blow, as well as Gottlebin herself. She tore her hair, threw her head against the wall, and tried to hurt herself in many ways. To Bloomheart, it was painfully obvious that the poor young woman was not in control of her own body, and that her only salvation was prayer. For certainly, if his words are to be believed, commanding the demons to leave the woman's body worked. With simple words, the pastor was supposedly able to rebuke every movement and force them to obey. And yet, all too quickly, they would return, with their sinister power becoming stronger again and again. It seemed as though his work only made things worse. In this way, Bloomheart explained quite candidly that all of his friends advised him to drop the case and abandon the seemingly helpless young woman to her fate. Yet, despite what he suffered in spirit and soul at the time, he simply couldn't. I had to think with horror of what would become of the person if I withdrew my hand from her, and how much I, if things went wrong, would stand accused before everyone as the cause of it all. I felt myself in a net out of which I could not possibly extricate myself. The devil, so he claimed, was trying to ensnare him in his own pride. And so Bloomheart rose above it, and returned to Gottlieben, determined at all costs to free her from the demons which sought to destroy both her and him. Very soon, the fourteen demons multiplied, until, sensationally, a tremendous 425 separate demonic entities are said to have lived inside the possessed woman. Bloomheart, praying over her, fought to banish them all. At night, whenever he was not there, Gottlieben claimed that shadows, dark figures, pressed around her bed. On one occasion, she even alleged to have felt herself suddenly seized on her neck by a burning hand. When her aunt, who was caring for her at the time, rushed with a light to inspect the young woman, she saw that large blisters, already filled with liquid, had risen all around her neck. The next day, the injuries were confirmed by a doctor. It is recorded that her neck took several weeks to heal. And so, one gets a sense of how the details of this case are not merely terrifying, but also tremendous and extensive. According to Bloomheart's report, which was translated into English and published in the 1970s, Gottlieben suffered many physical injuries throughout her alleged demonic possession, both at the hands of unseen forces, such as those which burnt her neck and herself. Many times, Bloomheart went to attend her and found her with a new wound or hurt, her chest beaten, her hair tore out, her nose bleeding, her body swollen extraordinarily. She would even, he claimed, vomit whole buckets of water. One of the most harrowing episodes is said to have begun on the evening of the 24th of July, 1842. Bloomheart states that he battled from 8 o'clock in the evening until 4 o'clock the next morning, all without result. In the following days, still tortured by what Gottlieben herself referred to as a plague, the young woman became more and more emaciated. The nighttime attacks, so it is said, had escalated to new and perverse planes, with her suffering painful and strong hemorrhages after being assaulted by spirit-like figures for up to three hours at a time. 
Far from being a figment of her imagination, the young woman was, on multiple occasions, reportedly discovered on her bed, swimming in blood, which forced itself through her dress everywhere on the upper part of her body. If this plague did not stop, she is said to have told the pastor in a moment of lucidity, it would be her death. And certainly, the medical doctor who had been attending her throughout was utterly confounded. According to Blumhart, he had tried all sorts of medical means without being able to bring about her healing. Gottlieben's demonic possession is said to have reached a monstrous peak the following month, in August 1842 when one of the voices possessing her claimed to be but one of 1,067 entities. Earlier that day, so it is said, in a fit of desperation, the young woman had twice attempted to end her own life. Bloomheart afterwards stayed with her for many hours, praying as a thunderstorm raged outside the house. Many voices are said to have spoken that night, some speaking in accents and other languages, most such as Bloomheart could not compare to any European language. Similar accounts of attempts at exorcism are described all the way into the opening months of the next year. In his report, Bloomheart describes many conversations he had with possessing entities, including one with the spirit of the woman who had, in some way, started the whole ordeal. He wrote that she, like many of the possessing entities, desired to be free of the devil. After talking with her, praying for her, he was able to convince her to leave the body of the young woman and move on elsewhere. According to the pastor, in this fashion it continued for a while. Whatever spirit was given a resting place did not return again. Many identified themselves by formally giving their names, which was done especially by those who had died since I had been installed as pastor in this town in 1838. Others mentioned places they were from, often hundreds of hours away. Some even said they came from America. Gottlieben had then, it seemed, acted as a host to many disparate and diabolical entities. But why? The answer, so it seemed, was dark magic. On the 8th of February, so Bloomheart wrote, a new period began in the history of Gottlieben's possession. Sinisterly, it is claimed that objects were charmed into her body. At first, it was small pieces of glass, which the young woman would expel via vomit. Soon, it is said, this progressed to small pieces of iron, and then old bent nails, with Bloomheart himself claiming to have witnessed, with his own eyes, the young woman retching up into a bowl twelve separate nails on one occasion. Unbelievably, she was soon, so he claimed, vomiting shoe buckles, often so large that one could hardly understand how they could even come up her throat as well as uncountable quantities of pins, lengths of wire, pieces of knitting needles, sometimes singularly and sometimes bound in bundles, tied together with feathers and paper. On one chilling occasion, Gottlieben is even said to have stopped breathing and lay as dead for several minutes when an especially large and broad piece of iron got stuck on its way out. Tremendously, even living animals, frogs, bats and locusts are said to have come from her mouth. Each time one of these vomiting episodes occurred, Gottlieben was left in such pain that she would more or less lose consciousness. As far as Blumhart was concerned, not merely was fraud on her part impossible, the incredible happenings having been witnessed by multiple people, but also entirely unimaginable given her level of suffering. Every object smuggled into her body, so the pastor explained, had the purpose of killing her. And, terribly, it seemed to be working. She lost consciousness regularly, stopped breathing many times, hemorrhaged to the point of near death, and even made further attempts on her own life. Confessing the circumstance of her early years to Blumhart, Gottlieben revealed that one of her childhood illnesses had been cured through the use of magical medications. Such, supposedly, had drawn her into the net of magic, something made all the worse by a cousin who she went to live with at the age of seven. Feared as an evil person, it was suggested that she had somehow pledged the girl's soul to the devil. Thus, this was why she suffered. She had been sold to Satan. And so, the possession and violent attacks continued. 
Then, from the 24th to the 28th of December 1843, the end appeared to be in sight. But first, Bloomheart and the Ditter's family had to endure one final marathon of madness. Both Gottlieb's sister, Katharina, and her half-blind brother are described as having fallen under the same demonic influence as their sibling. For the first time in the two-year-long possession, Katharina raged and threatened to tear the pasta into a thousand pieces. She was allegedly so violent that she had to be restrained. Her behaviour was entirely uncharacteristic. Bound, a demon then supposedly spoke through her. It was firm and declared itself to be not a spirit of a deceased person, but a prominent angel of Satan. As midnight approached, the young woman's rage increased, with her being seized with such violent shakings that it was as if she would shake off every limb individually. Then, so Bloomhart writes, at two o'clock in the morning, the supposed angel of Satan roared, while the girl bent her head and upper part of her body back over the backrest of the chair, with a voice of which one could hardly have believed a human throat capable. Jesus is Victor. Jesus is Victor. And after that, the power and strength of the demon seemed to be broken more with every moment. It became ever more quiet and calmer, and finally disappeared unnoticed, like the lifelight of a dying person goes out, however, not until eight o'clock in the morning. Katharina, along with her sister and brother, was free, and so, horrifically, thankfully, finally, the possession was over. These terrible and incredible events were described by Bloomhart in a report he wrote the following year, on the 11th of August, 1844. Sent to his superiors, the document's purpose was, so he explained in the preface, to be honest and open, and more than that, to respond to the urge which he felt within himself to tell it all. After all, at the moment of writing, he knew all too well the judgement that he risked in sharing what he referred to as his battle and conflict with Satan. For certainly, such vast and gruesome accounts of demonic possession belong more to the realm of the Catholic exorcist than they did to a Lutheran pastor. There was no recourse or right to which he could or indeed should have followed, he simply acted as he felt was right. Jesus, he declared, is victor, and it was in his name that he had worked. No matter what judgments might be, I have the satisfaction of having spoken the truth. As for Gottlieb in Dittus, a postscript added by Bloomhart in July 1850 revealed that a full six years later, she was well, and had moved into his home some four years previous to help his wife with housekeeping and child education. Most faithful and most understanding, she had become a much-loved member of the family. Her dark days, and the devil which brought them, long behind her. Thank you so much for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this episode, and also an extra special thank you to our members, both here on YouTube and on Patreon, whose support helps to make these videos possible. You are very much appreciated. And so with that, I am left with nothing more to say other than to wish you all a very safe and very spooky Halloween. Until next time, 